Product Harm Crisis Management – How to Lead a Company During a Crisis Paola Kane, Independently Published, 2019 Many Useful Tips to Understand the Phenomenon of Product Recall Crises for Harmful Products Learn Strategies to Deal with This Type of Crisis Find out how some big companies have dealt with crises caused by product recalls. The author, Paola Kane, is founder and CEO of Mia Solution, a consulting agency that specializes in legal consulting in different sectors, including food, cosmetics, and pharmaceuticals. She is a specialist in food safety procedures and has supported a number of companies in the management of crises linked to the recall of defective goods. What is Product Harm Crisis? Increasingly often, companies find themselves facing crises linked to problems caused by their own products, the so-called product harm crisis. This type of crisis happens in an incident when one or more of a company's products are harmful or poisonous, and they require a timely intervention to reduce the impact to a minimum. The strategy that a company adopts to manage this type of crisis is fundamental because not only does it minimize the risk to public health and therefore any possible lawsuits, but it also serves to demonstrate that the company can pick itself up after a crisis. The consequences of such events are often not only limited to the company itself, but they risk spreading to an entire category of products, because the shortcomings of a company in the production process can be perceived as a lack of standards in the entire sector. Harmful products put a strain on a company's reputation. A crisis caused by harmful products usually requires a recall campaign or a logistical operation aimed at removing the affected products from the market to minimize the risks to the consumer. These operations are often regulated at national level and in the USA, each state has laws that set out the correct procedure to follow. This type of event is one that really puts a company through its paces when it has to defend its reputation as well as its own financial interests and those of its stakeholders. Fortunately, these are not always serious situations with deadly consequences. The severity of such a situation largely depends on how harmful the product is. And for this reason, many companies underestimate the chances of this happening to them. Given the complexity of their processes and production chains, even the most vigilant companies are at considerable risk. Often it is only a matter of time before a company finds itself at the centre of a recall campaign. There are sectors that are more at risk, such as food or pharmaceuticals, but none are completely immune. For this very reason, it is important to have a clear plan for managing this eventuality. It is often impossible to predict such a crisis with any real certainty, but with a good strategy, the damage can be minimised and the company can recover quickly. All sectors are at risk. There are obviously some sectors in which these types of events are more likely to happen. Sectors such as food, pharmaceuticals or cosmetics offer products which by their very nature have a higher risk of doing damage if their standards of qualities are not respected or if problems should arise in the production process. Not surprisingly, these are among the sectors most subject to regulation and quality controls. When we see recall campaigns in these sectors, a phenomenon of extension can be observed in which companies in the same sector or carrying similar products also suffer the negative consequences of the recalls. The role of the media in a product harm crisis. In recent years, consumer needs have been given a lot of media attention and strong headlines can quickly lead to long-term consequences. If a company manages a crisis correctly, it can even improve its reputation, increasing consumer confidence. This is the reason why a company needs to respond quickly in a precise, responsible, efficient and transparent manner. The importance of behaviour in response to a crisis. By their very nature, product harm crises are multifaceted. They can affect small companies as well as multinationals and can be caused by both internal and external factors. Many executives believe their company is immune, but they are mistaken. Since a crisis can take a variety of forms, no company is completely safe. 
The process that usually leads to a recall campaign is fairly straightforward and usually begins with receiving information about the potential harm of a product. This can come directly from consumers or distributors. At this point, the company must decide what action to take. There are four types of reaction. Denial. The company denies any kind of responsibility and tries to minimize the problem. Involuntary recall. The product is only recalled if the company is required to do so by the authorities. Voluntary recall. The company decides to recall the product before they are requested to do so by the authorities. Maximum commitment. The company responds by showing an elevated level of responsibility, being both proactive and transparent. Companies that decide to go down the path of denial try to wash their hands of any involvement, risking, however, that the repercussions will be heavier later because they have put their interests before the health and well-being of their consumers. On the other hand, companies that respond in the best way that they can send a clear message by demonstrating responsible behavior and by making people's well-being a top priority, even at the cost of their own revenue. The characteristics of effective planning. Having a clear plan is absolutely essential because when the crisis hits, there is no time to make plans. It's time to act. Without a clearly defined plan, the initial response could take days, a time frame in which the damage could potentially increase exponentially. A good plan has to have some of the following essential elements. Crisis management team names and contact details. Contact lists of all the stakeholders. A table of evaluation to assess the risk. Forms to report and notify. Strategy cards. Media monitoring. Post-crisis evaluation and recovery. All too often, companies neglect the importance of this type of planning and they prepare generic plans to only find themselves having to manage a crisis without an adequate strategy and with disastrous consequences. Their crisis plans are limited to listing procedures and publishing declarations without offering a solid plan to deal with the many different aspects of a crisis. Once the plan has been laid out, we must not be fooled into thinking that our work is done. A good plan is in fact dynamic and contains documents that need to be updated regularly. Procedures should be flexible so that they can be adapted to different scenarios. Another aspect that we need to remember is drills. Just as we need to have in place an adequate fire drill that is practiced periodically, we also need to test our crisis management plan in the same way. In doing so, we will be able to test its efficacy and identify any areas for improvement. Finally, we need to remember that a strategy is not just a list of steps to follow, but a tool that we can refer to. That will help us to maintain operational control when we find ourselves responding to crisis situations. It will be the strong point to which we can remain anchored when we suddenly find ourselves having to manage this type of situation. It is important to be timely and precise. The first few hours of any crisis are the most delicate, because at this time there are often speculations and news leaks, true or false, so our response has to be quick. The sooner we can implement our plan and so communicate with the public, the better chance we will have of getting the situation under control. Obviously, this is going to be easier for smaller companies who are less subject to long and laborious internal communication processes. As soon as the crisis management plan is set in motion, the team will need to jump into action as quickly as possible. In particular, they will need to make moves to contain or limit the problem, recalling products, contacting people in the distribution chain. Communicate directly with anyone that has been harmed or suffered any harm or damages, including families and any possible victims. Communicate with employees, the authorities, customers, suppliers and anyone else who is involved, even if indirectly. Communicate with the media. As well as being quick, our response needs to be as accurate as possible. Providing inaccurate or incomplete data can risk worsening the company's position as well as showing a lack of respect for the people involved. The most important message that we need to transmit is that we care about the situation. We need to reassure those listening that we are doing everything in our power to manage and resolve the situation. 
If we don't have the information, we need to reassure the public that we are doing everything we can to gather precise, accurate data to help deal with the crisis in the best possible way. A leader needs a team that shares the load. In a crisis situation, the leader takes on a fundamental role because they become the point of reference for the public, for the media and shareholders, and most of all because they have legal responsibilities, which they must not shy away from. These are the moments when a leader must not only show that they have the power to make decisions, but must also show courage, honesty and integrity. A crisis can be an opportunity for a leader to demonstrate their capabilities, while it is also a good chance to hide any ineptitude or that they might be ill-prepared or lack integrity. The leaders that usually fall first are the ones that have always tried to show that they are invincible, because they tend to take a position of denial, diverting any responsibility in an attempt to disassociate themselves from the problem. This behavior often leads to bad decisions that risk putting the company in a worse situation than it was before. To avoid giving the management of the entire crisis to one single person, it is important to assign a crisis management team whose members will have clearly defined roles based on their individual responsibilities. There are three main functions that a crisis management team has. Operations, management of the recall campaign, product disposal and substitution through the distributor, etc. Communication, public relations, press conferences, etc. Specific capabilities, these can vary based on the sector and the product. These people offer support to team members to help them deal with areas that might require specific technical knowledge or experience in a particular area. Each member of this team should also have a few soft skills, including the ability to work under pressure, to communicate with other members, and to maintain a strong sense of control under pressure. The two main aspects of crisis management, operations and communication. There are two main areas that a company will have to take care of in a crisis. The first is the more operational area that involves collecting data, analysis, product recall and all logistical operations. The second, which is where many companies tend to fall down, is communication. Communicating with the public is an essential aspect of any crisis. Any communication must take place before, during and after any crisis event. A lack of communication is the worst strategy that a company can adopt because fear of the unknown is often much worse than any concrete fear and will lead to our customers feeling abandoned. This type of communication requires a structured approach with a clear outline that points to a central message, which is the message that we want to send to the public. To achieve this, there are a few steps that we can follow. Above all, we need to identify a leader who is in charge of the whole communicative process and of coordinating every company statement. After this, we will need to select the audience that the company's communication is aimed at. This includes customers, the distribution chain, the authorities and shareholders. Whoever is involved, even indirectly, will have to be continually updated. Once you have identified the people that make up your audience, you will need to identify their individual needs and interests. In this way, you will be able to anticipate any questions that will inevitably be asked and so prepare adequate answers ahead of time. Finally, it will be useful to consolidate all the previous steps taken to reinforce your central message that states the company's position clearly. Instead of just providing rhetoric and paying lip service, the company's message will need to be published through the official channels. In the age of the internet, where everyone has access to platforms that allow them to reach millions of people, we run the risk that people from any company could decide to publish personal statements. Looking for five minutes of fame. This, of course, can be extremely harmful to the company, so it is absolutely critical to have an official, clear communication channel. How to behave once the crisis has passed. The final phase of any crisis is recovery, or the return to business as usual. This is an extremely delicate moment that is often underestimated. Too many companies make the mistake of resting on their laurels once the dust of the media storm has settled, and it is at this very moment that the real effects of the crisis can be felt. 
the recovery phase can have several different aspects. Technical, the elimination of the products that caused the initial problem. Financial, compensation for damages to victims and the efforts required to repair any social damage. Business, the necessary changes to deal with the market after the event. Sales and public image. Following a crisis, the marketing department will be put through its paces, which costs great investment and effort. Whatever the consequences that we find ourselves having to deal with, our objective must be to calm the crisis as soon as possible. This often requires that the company or their spokesperson offer a public apology. This is a very difficult step because it requires an admission of guilt and this makes us vulnerable. But it can also show the public that we did everything we could, putting the health and well-being of our clients before everything else. And this is one of the advantages, if we can call it an advantage, of a crisis. It helps us see clearly that it is never too late to do the right thing. Quotes In conditions of absolute emergency, there is no time to plan. In times of crisis, we need to act. Crisis and deadlocks have one advantage. They push us to take action without delay. During a crisis, a company needs a leader, and a leader needs an excellent crisis management team. Crises have another advantage. They remind us that it is never too late to do the right thing. Take home message. More and more often, companies find themselves having to deal with a crisis caused by damage or poisonous products. No company is completely immune to this phenomenon, yet all too often they do not have an adequate plan in place to manage such a situation. As well as logistics management for product recall, a company also needs to take care of public announcements and to manage the post-crisis recovery phase. When an emergency hits, there is no time to plan. That is the moment to take action.